valve control for cylinder deactivation. I know your first reaction might be, aren't you going to tell us everything we need to know about cylinder deactivation? Yes, we are. But the heart of this system is the valves. Now, some people have bad memories. Some people don't even know about it. But in 1981, we had a Cadillac engine called the 864 that went from an 8-cylinder, 6-cylinder, to a 4-cylinder. It was an underpowered system, not very well done, did not get better mileage, and was a real disaster. One of the parts of that disaster were the computers were not as powerful in 81 as they are now. In fact, now computers are 50 times faster than the ones used in 1981. And test drivers, personal experience, have found the new system to be smooth with no noticeable change in switchover between four and eight cylinders. The electronic throttle that is being utilized here is part of the solution. It manages the changeover RPM. When you switch from eight to four, it automatically gives a very small increase in throttle opening so you never notice the loss of power. Then when it switches from four back to eight, it backs off it ever so slightly so you have no noticeable change. Now Chrysler's Hemi and their system is called displacement on demand. GM and their trucks and Cadillacs and so forth call it the active fuel management. Both systems work with Eaton components and Delphi Electronics to selectively deactivate the cylinders. Chrysler and GM deactivate four and eight cylinders, four of the eight cylinders on their engine. Highway mileage showed a marked improvement at 65 miles an hour. And yes, we know that some people want to drive 70 or 75. Truth is, 150 horsepower can move 65, 70, 75. It's a matter of how much throttle you put on it. Higher speeds, more throttling, the vehicle will spend more time in eight-cylinder modes and give you lower mileage. These are large V8 engines that can easily cruise on four cylinders if the driver doesn't demand too much power. And the changeover in power comes back in three milliseconds when the throttle is moved, demanding higher power. So it's very quick, very smooth, and the motorist is going to get a 300-plus horsepower engine that gets 28 miles per gallon in the EPA highway test. While the EPA highway test may not be all that accurate, 28 miles per gallon on a 300-horsepower engine is still phenomenal. And for pickup trucks, it's been well-received by drivers who want to have power when it's needed, like towing, construction jobs, hardling loads, and get better gas mileage when the power isn't needed. Everybody is paying attention to the price of gasoline these days. How does it work? Well, the cylinder, the PCM stops injecting fuel to the deactivated cylinders. Oh, no brainer. That's easy. We don't have to fire those plugs anymore either because it's got coil on plug. We've all seen it deactivate injectors. We see that every time we back off and watch injector pulse width go to zero when we do a decel. Now, the PCM is going to disable the opening of the intake and exhaust valves on the disabled cylinders. And your first reaction is, but wait, that's going to trap air. That's not going to do anything. We'll show you what it does later. Just take our word for it. It disables the openings of the intake and exhaust on the disabled cylinders. We're going to shut them down. And we're going to tell you why that works like a spring in a little while and makes the system actually work better. Now, the valve control system uses a special lifter manufactured by Eaton, and they're installed on these selected cylinders. This is a close-up of the Eaton lifter. There is a space in here where you see that small spring. It's a very special lifter on, these, on the intake and exhaust valve. What it can do is when, lifter, when oil pressure is applied to this lifter, it can collapse, and the lifter will not move the push rod as the cam is riding on that uh, roller bearing in the bottom. We're still riding on the cam. It's going up and down, but we've collapsed that lifter at the top, so it comes down, and it doesn't move the push rod. It's a collapsible valve lifter. We put all pressure. It collapses. Here's the way it looks. We have a solenoid out here that's going to control all pressure on those four cylinders. 
and you see them coming down here in these tubes. A solenoid can control this oil pressure to a distribution manifold you see at the top that supplies oil pressure to these special lifter tubes. These tubes are going to be attached to the lifters that are blue. All the cylinders work normal with no oil pressure applied. Nothing is happening. Once the tubes attached to the lifters get oil pressure, the red cylinders are, are, are deactivated. We no longer run with the two outside cylinders on one bank, the two inside cylinders on another. This gives us good balance. We close off the intake and exhaust together. Okay, Closing both the intake and exhaust seems odd, doesn't it? Why are we going to close off both of them? Here we've shown you these ghost cylinders are shut down on this left side. They've got the special lifters. They've got the oil pressure attached to them. And now you can see they're collapsed down and they're not working anymore. Why would you do that? Well, the trapped air in the cylinder acts like a spring. It is compressed when other cylinders are firing, and once it passes top dead center, it springs back. So what the cylinders become is an air spring. When other cylinders are firing, it's storing energy, being compressed. When it goes past top dead center, it springs back down, releasing some of the energy stored during the firing of other cylinders. Okay. Stop and think about that for a moment. We're getting two cylinders. One's coming up two cylinders at a time. One's coming up on compression and firing, and one is just compressing air. When they go back down the other side, the one that was compressing now releases energy back in and smooths out things. It works very well. The spring action smooths the engine by storing energy when other cylinders are firing and pushing it down after their top dead center. The problems observed so far as a result of incorrect oil being used and oil that lost its anti-foaming properties that are needed for these to activate. We're, this is still too new to find any major failures in how long life is going to be. But good oil has always been important for all of the valve control systems we've talked about, and this is no different. So with that as a base assumption, we have to assume that you're going to have to use decent oil. There is not much for you to do here for diagnostics. The variable valve control is expanding quickly and is projected to be on all vehicles in the near future. And this is just another version of variable valve control. All you have to do to diagnose this is make sure that the solenoid is working on the manifold. It's going to increase fuel economy. At the same time, give better performance to improve the vehicle, which is attractive to the customer. Many of the new engine designs are also going to be using gasoline direct injection, or GDI. In one of our upcoming series, the sets of data, we're going to talk about GDI along with wide-range air fuel ratio sensors because in a lot of cases, you're going to have to have the wide-range air fuel ratio sensor to take full advantage of direct injection. As we go through this, we're going to try to give you a continuous series of advancing technologies that work together and tying the pieces together so you understand how they work together. Just like you saw how variable valve timing, variable valve control worked well with electronic throttle and cylinder deactivation here. So take your time, study this, understand how it works, and we'll be giving you more information about some very specific diagnostics in the future when we have a, had some diagnostic time on these systems that are using displacement on demand or active fuel management.